What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Well Man's Podcast. My name is Brian Brosey. I'm joined by my friend and well-rested Keone Tita. <laughs> Finally, last night I got nine hours of sleep. All right, boom. Hey, everybody! Thanks for joining us again. Um, this is our um, well, gosh, this is really like our fourth episode on sleep if we count way back when episode nine and one hundred and one. I think we did on sleep also. Yeah, for sure, one hundred and one. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we have um, our first episode in this series coming out. Is it um, next week? Next. Yep. Which means last week for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. And then we're probably going to do, we're doing like three or four of these. And at the end, we'll have a bullet point for how to improve your sleep naturally. And why is that so important? Because sleep is your number one universal broad spectrum healthcare provider. There yeah. is nobody, any pill, potion, powder, anybody out there that can do for you what sleep can do. It helps you live longer. It improves your memory. It makes you much more creative, makes you much more beautiful. As you can tell, look how beautiful I look um, from my nine hours of sleep. Uh, keeps you slim and fit and lowers food cravings. Uh, protects you from heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, wards off viral infections, which we'll talk about in a minute, makes you less depressed and anxious and more happy. And um, if you don't get sleep, you can expect increased risk in all those things and more of the bad stuff. And we'll talk about that, more of the bad health, health consequences. But sleep really is the universal health care provider. And there are well over 17,000 studies on the benefits of sleep. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's- Well-researched. It's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's very well-researched, and man, I, I wish I knew about sleep when I was going through my undergraduate studies, high school. I mean, I mean, really, this is like, it should be life-changing for people. You get more sleep, you're improving your health, you're improving your creativity, you're just, you're just a, a better person, better person to be around too. Less miserable, that type of thing. So sleep yeah. is great. Yeah, I know I am. <laughs> a lot less <laughs> yeah. miserable. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I guess one of the main questions, I think we brought this up in the last podcast, what is the ideal amount of sleep? Well, it seems, to, it seems that the research is saying somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. So I just shoot for the middle, eight hours of sleep. I mean, it seems like the more, the better based on the research, but seven to seven to nine hours, maybe a little over eight hours is really what you should try to get. Yeah. And your body benefits from all stages of sleep. Last podcast, we talked about NREM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, and then REM sleep. Um, and NREM sleep has like four stages. You go through these stages. You, you cycle through these stages, you know, quite a few times during the night, four to six times during the night. And you need to go through all those stages for the health benefits. And if you go through all those stages, one of the main benefit is sleep as your most useful memory aid. And that's what sleep does. It kind of consolidates you know, your memories, make sure that you store your short-term memories that you need into long-term memory, make sure that you get rid of the short-term memories that you don't need. So sleep does that. So let's yeah, so talk about that. clearing all the files, basically, of your computer. It is. It, you can think about it's analogous to a computer that, you, you know, you're just clearing out the files that you don't need and you're storing the files that you do need. So sleep is one of the best things you can do for learning. And this is why I wanted to know about this stuff. Wish I would have known about it early on in my life. Right. But any stage in your life benefits from sleep. So even well into you know being elderly or into your 80s and 90s, you should get as much sleep as you can. Last episode, we talked about the myth of older people not needing as much sleep. That is a myth. You need just as much sleep as you did in your young, in your 30s and 20s. So eight hours across the board is a good number to shoot for, for people that uh, of all ages for the most part. 
there are different requirements of sleep for different ages, but about eight hours. So just real quick, I, I wanted to bring this up because some people may be interested in the, like what happens to the brain when you are creating, consolidating memories and learning. So basically your short-term memory storage area is what's called the hippocampus. And, and what happens during NREM light sleep is you start having these waves of neuronal impulses and at a specific frequency, you get what's called sleep spindles. And these spindles are just neuronal firings and they happen at, you know, these defined intervals and these sleep spindles seem to be very, very important for consolidating memories and for creativity and for, um, you know, just improving uh, function, muscle memory, that type of thing. So if those sleep spindles, the more you have, the more likely you're going to consolidate memories into long-term storage, which is in your cortex. So the more sleep spindles, the better, the better at night. And it probably has something to do with, you know, not only like consolidating memories, but overall health. Yeah, are these sleep spindles, Keone, are they coming through in like a EMG type assessment? Or are these a uh, thing we actually see that are part of the brain? Yeah, it is like a EM, it is like uh, an EEG, right? So, so yes, you, you have these um, electrodes on the brain, you're just, you're, you can watch them as, a, as you go through the cycling of it, you can see it happening. Okay. As you're, as you're watching, you know, if you're a sleep doctor, you can watch as you go through the sleep cycles, you can see these things happen. And that's a, what, basically what you see is defined as a sleep spindle. Yeah. And okay. unfortunately these sleep spindles, when they happen, um, you know, you, as you get older, you seem to get less and less of that. And we're not sure why, or that the science isn't sure why, but it may have something to do with just age alone. Um, there, it's very interesting though, to coordinate like in a metronomic type way, um, with these sleep spindles with sounds or in rhythm with these sleep spindle bursts, like putting um, a mild electrical impulse into the brain. Nothing like that's going to shock you or anything, but something you wouldn't even feel. But it's if it's entrained or in sync with those, it seems like this helps further for with memory. So that's fascinating to me. So there may be in the future something that can actually improve your memory. Um, improve your learning by doing this entrainment and it seems to work with almost anything so you can use like a metronomic sound may help if it's if it's in sync with this firing or within sync of the rhythms of the neuronal impulses of of your of NREM sleep um, and these spindles you can also maybe possibly any memories that are not wanted that are there. So I can think about it as being used for people with PTSD, right? I mean, think about how great it would be to get rid of memories that are just so ingrained in the brain that are just negative memories that kind of inhibit your life. I mean, that would be extremely helpful for people. So yeah. it goes both, it can go both ways. Yeah, it'd be interesting to find out what the the best metronome or music, like you were saying, to play in cadence with those sleep spindles would be it's probably yeah. poison it's probably like every rose has a thorn but poison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it could be hey it could be. but you know it, it this is it's it's really interesting if you um and i kind of had a hint of this when i was a, a child um practicing i played clarinet so when i was okay. a child I, I wish i would have kept up with it um, but after a long day of practicing the clarinet, um, there are certain notes or chords or, or whatever, you know, that may hold me up. And if I had a good night's sleep, it would almost seem like that my practice would shift from like memory almost into my subconscious. So then when I hit mm. it the next day, I just would practice with fluidity, mm. right? 
yeah, yeah. I mean, all athletes even talk about this. Um, think about right. people doing like Tai Chi, mm -hmm. right? And you're practicing certain forms. And the more you practice, if you get good night's sleep with that practice, now all of a sudden your form or whatever you're doing becomes fluid to where you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So somebody who is a martial artist, probably this would really hit home for them. Or somebody who is a musician, this may really hit home with them. And I've had this happen to me a couple of times in my life, but another time where, where maybe me and you both had this is think about like when you are doing a lot of study on something, right? It's almost like if you're doing academic study on something and you get a good night's sleep, that all of a sudden it's consolidated into learning that almost is, can be recalled at a moment's notice. And it makes you real learning when you learn something, it makes you more creative and perceive whatever you learned in a light that may not have been thought of before. Okay? Yeah, hundred percent. All right. Um, and it's, and I think this is, so this is what's really interesting. I think this is what may be going on with very creative people or people throughout human history who have had these, you know, very innovative, creative thoughts that have pulled humanity forward. I think it has a lot to do with deep thinking and then deep thinking interspersed with deep sleep. Yeah. So, and, and the research seems to say that. So when you hear practice makes perfect, you know, really it's like practice with good sleep is what makes perfect it's what puts it into the subconscious so that you don't have to think about it as a pianist or a you know whatever art form you're doing if you're a skateboarder or you know some type of athlete you just don't have to think about it anymore you just you're able to get in the zone without having to think about it. i mean think about how fast you'd have to that you know think about how slow you'd be if you had to run 100 meters if you had to think about every step you're taking and right. how what muscles you're going to contract Right. You know, sleep just makes everything more fluid. Yeah. I mean, we've definitely all experienced it in some capacity, whether you're, uh, you know, I've been studying and it seems like nothing makes sense and you go to bed and all of a sudden you wake up the next day and everything's nice and logical within your brain, step-by-step -step sequence. You remember yep. it better. And kind of like you mentioned, it's easy. I remember this with chemistry specifically, but where it kind of absorbs into your subconscious and it becomes a little bit easier to intellectually look at versus kind of the that foreignness you feel when you're learning something new right and you you you, nece you can't necessarily play with it on your own if that makes right. sense and then after yeah. kind of undergoing that learning you have the ability to understand it and play with it within your own thoughts and opinions right right and you have a desire and lose the frustration over not being able to you have the desire and enjoy the challenge instead of being frustrated where you have to like throw the book at the wall or something, you know? Yeah, that's me. It, it, it be, yeah, it becomes, it, it, learning becomes more enjoyable, yeah. you know, especially with good sleep. So, um, so what we know is that it significantly improves neuroplasticity. It just shapes the brain in a very healthy way and, and actually molds and shapes the body in a healthy way, which we'll get into in, in, just, a, in just a second. Um, what other, what else? Oh, speaking on that same theme, also uh, recovery after performing, especially athletic events, work, workouts, um, after, um, you know, performing any art form or anything, um, post-performance sleep also is important. It helps solidify things and it helps you recover significantly, right? So if you are... I remember like during high school, we, we, we would play, uh, you know, I, I played football in high school and you know, what we would do during the summers have these two day practices. They were ridiculous. You'd get up early in the morning, for like the whole summer, I don't know, like six in the morning. And then you'd be out at the field at eight, eight to 11. And then you'd go home, have lunch and come back the next day. And then you start all over again. By the end of the week, you just, you know, 
You, mm-hmm. you just couldn't function. It's not, it, it really, doing that type of practice without really thinking about the rest phase, specifically sleep, does more harm than good. Yeah. So athletes really need to think about that. And, and people in their, in their normal lives, average people like me and you and other people really have to think about sleep improves function in normal everyday life activities. Right. Right. I, I mentioned on the last podcast, and it's not necessarily a hun- like at the cellular level, hundred percent true, but when you're sleeping, it's like the only time you're really anabolic and living in itself is catabolic. So it's, you know, living and working out, like you mentioned right after workout is breaking down tissues and all that sort of stuff. And you're right. only rebuilding and regaining or building more on top of what you broke down when you're anabolic and when you're in that resting state of sleep. Right. And why are you anabolic when you're in your sleep? What is the actual hormone that's, that's secreted at a very productive level when you sleep? There's actually two. The first one is growth hormone. Sleep is the best way to get growth hormone in your body. It's very anabolic. It's a repair hormone. And the other way for both men and women, you get a burst of testosterone. Both hmm. of those are anabolic hormones. So with sleep, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute in a little bit here. So, um, so the brain benefits are huge. We, we've seen in the research that for neurological diseases, you name them, any type of dementia or anything like that, the more sleep you get, probably the less likely you're going to get that disease or the less severe that disease will be. It can be used as a preventive and as a treatment. So I'm, I'm talking about Alzheimer's. I'm talking about even psychoemotional illness. I'm talking about bipolar. I'm talking about OCD, anxiety, depression. All of these have plenty of signs say, stating that you can use sleep or indicating as a preventive for these things and also significantly as a natural treatment for all of these. So if you are somebody who's getting less than five hours a night at sleep, you are at significant risk less than four, even more risk. The less sleep, the more at risk you are for any type of disease, especially these neurological stuff. Um, Very interesting about um, a study that was kind of hinted or highlighted uh, sleep, being sleep deprived is a study where they looked at how many hours of sleep you have and the increased risk of crashing your car, Mm -hmm. right? And less than five hours, it increases your crash risk in a, by driving by threefold. Less than four by 11.5 fold. Each hour lost amplifies motor vehicle accident crash. Mm. Um, not only do we need a breathalyzer, we need a sleep meter. Not, and actually, I would say the sleep meter would, do, would, would be more of a benefit for society because most people are sleep deprived And what people don't realize when they're driving is that you can very easily, without you even knowing it, go into what's called micro sleeps. And that's like two to three second sleeps, which is more than enough time to get in an accident. So, so there's, there's risk of people just falling asleep at the wheel, but what's much more common are these micro sleeps where people are just dozing for one to five seconds off. And, you know, that's extremely dangerous. And the research seems to indicate that, yes, as you're implying, lack of sleep is more risky than driving drunk. The problem is most people who drive drunk are also don't have enough sleep, too. You know, you think about it. So so that even amplifies things even worse. Yeah. So. Anyway, there's some, there were some studies that indicated being awake for 19 hours makes you as cognitively impaired as driving drunk. Well, think about how many people do that. Staying awake for 19 hours. Well, that means if you're awake for 19 hours, you're only getting five hours of sleep within that 24 hour period. And you are as con- cognitively impaired as driving drunk. That's pretty scary. After 16 hours of being awake, the brain begins to fail. So basically the brain is not on point. You have trouble focusing. All right. Um, And then on top of that, think about the financial burden to society when every 30 seconds in the U S someone is crashing their car due to sleep walk to due to sleep loss. So it is definitely by far worse than alcohol. And unfortunately 
we focus on, you know, we have these, these huge PR, you know, things that go again, you know, are out there on drunk, don't drive drunk and all this stuff. And really, you, you know, you probably do, I mean, they're great. I'm glad they're doing it, but you would do more benefit by really having these huge PR campaigns about getting enough sleep not only for people on the road, but for total health, because sleep is the master healer, yeah. especially when combined, like, you know, I think we talked about it last time, looking at, if we had to say, what's the master healer for the body, um, looking, looking at sleep, diet, and exercise, it's by far sleep. It, it, the benefits so, far outweigh either one of those. Yeah, 100%. So let's, let's go into... Um, let's get away from the brain and go into like the cardiovascular system and talk about some of the mechanisms that, you know, sleep, sleep loss or getting sufficient sleep kind of drive. Okay. Now, Keone, if I have a lower heart rate during my sleep, does that mean I got a deeper sleep necessarily or are they coordinated? Yeah, just, yeah to some extent. Yes. And I'll talk about that in just a second because we do know this. We do know that uh, if you have a uh, lack of sleep, your heart rate goes up. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, I guess from this, this little section that we're going to go over, um, if people out there listening, just remember unhealthy sleep means unhealthy heart, unhealthy heart, unhealthy cardiovascular system. So um, one of the main reasons that the cardiovascular system suffers under the stress of lack of sleep is due to blood pressure increasing or hypertension. And let's keep in mind that hypertension kills 7 million people per year due to what it does on the cardiovascular system. Card cardiac failure, ischemic heart failure, stroke, and then also has a significant uh, negative impact on kidney function. So you get kidney failure. So here are some studies that I just want to go over. So experiments that are, most, of, most of the experiments we're talking about are just across the board in general on young fit individuals. Cause a lot of the experiments done are done in university age kids who tend to not have any issues, tend to be fit, tend to be healthy. Um, so a lot of these studies, you can just put that in as a broad, you know, kind of rule that most of them are done on fit, healthy kids, yeah. you know, twenties, twenties, we'll say. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, anyways, experiments show that sleep loss of one night, just one to two hours will do the following. So we're talking about one night of sleep, poor sleep, and we're talking about less than optimal sleep of one to two hours lost, all right? So we're talking about, all right, you only got six hours. Um, I did that just the other night. <laughs> um, but what it does is it increases the sympathetic nervous system, right? And what does the sympathetic nervous system do? do? It causes cortisol to increase. Um, and oh, and not only does it increase the sympathetic nervous system, it prolongs it to stay in overdrive too. And I'm going to talk about that in a second when I say prolonging it. Um, but if you increase cortisol and the sympathetic nervous system is up, you get the speed up or a higher rate of a contracting heart. So it kind of hits on what you're talking about. So your mm -hmm. heart rate increases. If your heart rate increases, you get uh, more of a biometric rate of blood pumped through the system. So more blood going through the system, heart going faster. Um, and due to that, uh, with cortisol, you get a narrowing of the arteries, especially the coronary arteries, because cortisol will do that. If you narrow the arteries, you're pumping harder and you're pumping more. What's happening? You're getting an increase in blood pressure in the arteries. Okay. Now with lack of sleep, you're not anabolic. Like you are saying, you're mostly catabolic. And the reason why is because if you don't get the sleep, that you need, you don't get a big surge of growth hormone. And guess what growth hormone does? It heals your body. And specifically, it heals the endothelium within the arteries mm. of your body. If you're not getting that, every pump of your heart, we talked about this on our blood pressure uh, podcast way back, it creates little micro tears. Every time your blood leaves your heart, it leaves with force and it, it creates little micro tears in your arteries. And if you can't repair those every night, then your body has to go into what we call cementing and an emergency protocol. The cementing is cholesterol with calcium and placking. And that's mm. what it does. So you don't get growth hormone, growth hormone shut off, and therefore your lining can't replenish. And yet you're still going on five, six hours 
of night of sleep and it never stops. The sympathetic system is an overdrive, cortisol doesn't, doesn't increase, blood pressure stays up, you're, you're constantly degrading the arterial walls and now you're getting atherosclerosis and you're very prone to heart attack. So that's the general mechanism and what really sucks with this <laughs> is once you lose some sleep or not get enough, at least with three nights of good sleep afterwards of that one night, the effects were still seen. Mm. They're not indefinite, but they were still seen. Right. So you have to really do your best to try to get sleep. Yeah. Um, another one, these were research that's done at the University of Chicago. They studied 500 um, healthy adults. I think these were older individuals now, but, but anyway, they had no existing heart disease or signs of atherosclerosis. Um, what, and it, so I, it may be all ages or, or, um, help just help the individual. Didn't really say the age as far as I, I read, but anyway, they were tracked for a number of years while they were okay. assessing their sleep. Okay. So if you were, then they looked at the data assessing sleep. If you were one of the participants that only got five to six hours of sleep, you are 200 to 300% more likely to suffer calcification of your coronary arteries rel relative to those who slept seven to eight hours. Mm. So you're at increased risk of heart attack. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, that, that kind of blew me away. Yeah, you're really compounding a host of negative factors. Yep. Another study. So they want to see, well, you know, what is, why do we see a spike in daylight savings times, right? I think yeah. like in March, what, we spring forward in March, right? So yep. if we spring forward, we lose an hour, right? I think, yes. Yep. Am I saying about that right? Okay. We lose an hour. Well, guess what happens around March time when we do that? We get a huge spike in heart attacks. And then guess what happens in the fall when we gain an hour? The heart attack rate plummets. I mean, that's fascinating to me. That is, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a public health concern that we do this whole daylight savings time. You know, it's like, I'm thinking it should be done away with. Or yeah, shout out to Arizona or whatever that <laughs> state is that doesn't do it. Yeah, exa exactly. So how about diabetes? And diabetes and cardiovascular disease, they tend to go hand in hand. But the less you sleep, another, another saying, the less you sleep, the more you eat. And why would that be? Well, First, a little bit about high blood sugar. The more you eat, the higher the blood sugar goes, the more harmful it is to your body. Diabetics are very prone to blindness, kidney failure, nerve disease. Mm -hmm. um, epidemiological studies, we, we see that there are far higher rates of diabetes with sleep loss. We know this. We know that it's strong. there's a strong correlation there. Um, adults with no existing signs of diabetes or blood sugar issues, if they were sleep deprived for six night, nights for four hours a night, so six nights, only four hours a night of sleep, um, what they found was participants were 40% less effective at absorbing a standard dose of glucose compared to when they were fully rested. So basically, wow. the body doesn't know what to do with glucose. You eat something, you don't get good sleep, and now your glucose just floats around in your body. And why don't we like glucose floating around the body? Because it will glycate to things. And what that means is it will bind to proteins and basically slow them down, inactivate them, and create inflammation. All right? Mm -hmm. And then when you get inflammation, your body can't repair. So it's like this vicious cycle. And inflammation leads to what? Heart disease. So yeah. it, goes, it goes hand in hand. Yeah, shout out to me as a high schooler staying up till two or four in the morning eating pop tarts and chips and God knows what else. And right, <laughs> I'm sure that did a number. Right, I mean a young body repairs repairs better than an older body, but it's but as we can see from a lot of these studies, which are done in younger individuals, the the damage is being done at a yeah. young age. And then why is sleep loss related to weight gain? You know, and it's a good question to ask because if you're thinking, well. If I'm up, I'm probably more active. I mean, this is, could be the thinking, right? So I'm probably right, I'm more active. I'm burning the midnight oil. Yeah, I'm burning, I'm burning the midnight oil. I'm not, I'm not getting sleep. But actually what we find is sleep is your best fat burning time. All right. So when you lose sleep, you, you gain weight. Study, uh, studies at the University of Chicago with Dr. E. Van Cotter. 
done some fascinating studies. Um, individuals were more ravenous with lack of sleep despite giving the same amount of food to their sleep sufficient counterparts. That was so, me in high school. Yeah. So you get a good night's sleep and the other group doesn't get a good night's sleep. The people who got good night's sleep are not hungry. The other group that doesn't get the good night's sleep are ravenous. They're hungry. So they're yeah. going around hungry all the time. So what does that say about what's going on with the hormonal environment? Well, the two hormones, two big hormones that have to do with hunger are leptin and ghrelin. Leptin is the hormone that signals when you are full. It's usually secreted by fat cells and ghrelin is secreted by the stomach. Uh, ghrelin is the, the hormone that's secreted that signals when you're hungry. So just think about it. leptin signals when you're full, ghrelin signals when you're hungry. Lack of sleep causes an imbalance in those, all right? So inadequate sleep, decreases leptin. So if you decrease leptin, you don't get the signal you're full, right? right. And if you increase leptin, uh, ghrelin, now you're, now, and this is what happens with lack of sleep. Now you're thinking that you're extremely hungry. So you're eating more, you still don't think you're satiated, and you're really, really hungry. So the body cries famine in the midst of plenty. And that's what's going on with lack of sleep. Yeah, and Brian eats pop darts. Yeah, <laughs> right. What, yeah, yeah. Keon, Keone needs his chocolate, and you know his uh, tortilla chips. Yeah, you know. So that's one way inadequate sleep really messes you up. Um, another mechanism that's fascinating is we talked about this on our endocannabinoid podcast, um, and we were talking about in an endocannabinoids from an exogenous source like marijuana or CBD and stuff like that. But in that podcast, we also said that your body makes endocannabinoids. Okay. Well, guess what lack of sleep does? Another mechanism that makes you hungry is your body produces more of your endocannabinoids. So it almost makes you, I, I don't know if you want to say high in a sense, not getting enough sleep. And what does it do? It binds to these endocannabinoids receptors, which we know when you get in the your endogenous endocannabinoids or any binding to those receptors those receptors send signals that say you're hungry and not only are you hungry you're not hungry for healthy stuff right you know have you ever been high brian i have <laughs> i want to eat crunchies i want to eat crunchies i want to eat sweet stuff and i want to keep eating <laughs> yeah i <laughs> definitely know, have never inhaled but continue <laughs> <laughs> i know you haven't <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, but anyway, if you've been high, everybody knows what the munchies are. Mm -hmm. So, so um, if lack of sleep does the same thing, so yeah. you already told me you already told me you've been you've had lack of sleep. So you've been high before, Brian. We know based on <laughs> lack of based on lack of sleep alone. Well, right. it's interesting <laughs> that you you talk about the endocannabinoids increasing, and then we previously are talking about how you're more not lethargic, but kind of in the same state you would be after drinking. So really, if you're not getting sleep, you're, you're having a party in night. That's for sure. Without oh, even yeah. partying. That's you're right. You're fucked up with nothing. Right. You better get your <laughs> right. sleep. Right. And unfortunately, the lack of sleep doesn't feel too good. Like it may, <laughs> if you're, <laughs> you know, you just feel like shit most yeah. of the time yeah. and you're eating and you just feel awful and you're more depressed and you're more anxious all the while inflammation is increasing and you're, you're shortening your lifespan if you do that day in and day out. <laughs> yeah, just cut that little snippet and boom. Yeah. Get your damn sleep. Holy cow. Right. Um, another study, study participants were subjected to the same amount of physical exercise, right? So this speaks to burning the midnight oil, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. Same amount of physical exercise. Um, and one group had lack of sleep. The other group had sleep. They were given free access to a buffet, the sleep deprived participants. You guessed it, ate a lot more than the sleep sufficient participants. They calculated the amount of calories at the end of a year if they kept going on, how many calorie um, in excess they would have eaten. It would have been 70,000 extra calories based on being wow. sleep deprived. And it, it, that, that works out to about 300, 300 extra calories per day that you're eating extra. Poof. Um, you said calculated, oh. very North Carolinian, Keone. Calculated. <laughs> you hear that, <laughs> really you hear that southern that accent? You hear that southern <laughs> accent? Yeah, you're down in the, the north of the south, so you don't have that accent anymore. <laughs> you, you've lost your accent. Um, another way, this is another minor mechanism of why we uh, may eat too much. Um, we know that lack of sleep also causes a breakdown in the communication uh, 
neuronal communication in the prefrontal cortex. Anyway, your prefrontal cortex is kind of like your brain that allows you to be thoughtful or to, you know, be mindful of stuff that you're doing to like, you know, sit back and think about what stupid thing you may be doing so that you don't do that stupid thing, right? Yeah, separating well, you from your reptile you. That's exactly, that's what it does. And um, well, you can think about what lack of sleep does to that. You, you become right. the ravenous reptile. You know, yeah. because you just make mindless decisions. Impulsive. On- Sh- shout out yeah, to the yeah. gamblers. <laughs> what a <laughs> what a terrible situation when you're at a uh, I don't know, darn. What are they? That, a that, casino. You know what? That would be fascinating studies, right? That would be fascinating yeah. study because that the lack of sleep is definitely making you make more poor decisions, and plus you get the dopamine boost from every time you hit the slot machine or whatever you're doing, right? Yeah. So yeah. They, so they love happen. it when you're not happy. No wonder why Vegas is set up the way it is. Oh, it's set you're, up you're drunk, you're alcohol, da da da. Yep, everything. You, you got it. Slept in a you while. got it. Shut the windows, no clocks. You can go on and <laughs> on. All the while you're becoming more and more unhealthy and poorer by the minute. <laughs> yeah, in all facets. Yeah, yeah. And so um this the now I'm I'm gonna just jump to the reproductive system real quick because this kind of blows me away. All Fingers right? crossed for bigger PP. Big, bigger PP, uh, more virility, increase your chances of fertility for both men and women. So in general, sleep improves fertility, um, improve, yeah, pro, you know, I'd love to see the study, probably makes your PP bigger. So there you go. Well, it certainly, it certainly, it certainly increases testosterone. Right. So, you know, testosterone incre- improves libido and right. has a huge impact on sexual function in both men and women. So study at a University of Chicago, group of healthy younger males, limited to five hours of sleep per week, marked drop into testosterone levels relative to their own baseline when fully rested. Yeah. Okay. So they just five hours of sleep per week, testosterone levels plummet. The the hormonal blunt effect of this was so large that it effectively looked like it it ages a man by like 10 to 15 years in terms of testosterone virility. Mm. That's fascinating to me. Yeah. Also, there was a 20% lower sperm count and then poor morphology of sperm. So a much more deformed sperm. So any fertility treatments, I mean, you got to start off with, are you sleeping okay? Especially when it comes, well, both men and women, let's talk about, let's talk about women too, but both men and women, you can improve your chances of fertility um, and you know, just make se- improve sexual function so much by just getting better sleep right yeah um it's uh an, another thing is is what what do we know about testosterone we talked about this in our testosterone podcast i think this was we had a i think a couple but i think we specifically had one on testosterone way back in podcast yep. one or two something like that yep. maybe i think three. it was number two yeah anyway low t fatigue poor concentration weight gain around the middle poor definitely poor sex sex life apathy uh, muscle mass is ruined. Um, you improve T, you get better muscle mass, you get better bone density, you improve strength. Um, sleep is your most powerful natural hormonal environment. So let's talk about women. Study in women, less than six hours per night resulted in a 20% drop in follicular releasing hormone, which rises shortly. This is the hormone that rises shortly just before ovulation and is necessary for conception. Okay. Mm. So women who work night shift hours or erratic hours had the following when compared to controls that slept more than eight hours, they had 33% higher rate of abnormal menstruation. They had much lower fertility rates and they had also, this sucks. They also had higher rates of miscarriage in their first trimester than their sleep sufficient counterparts. Mm. I wonder if that's correlated to sleep while you're pregnant, sleep like, you know, where in the, I'm sure throughout the entire experience, pre well, while conceiving I, before yeah, I, I think it's across the board based yeah. on some of these studies i mean um, it looks like they're definitely looking at uh you know first try at least first trimester preg- parts of pregnancy so but anyway i think it's across the board yeah um another study you impl- you kind of hit on this study at the beginning um I was kind of admiring myself by looking at myself in the camera here because I got a good night's sleep last night. There's actually a study that shows that the more sleep you have, the more attractive you are to a uh, a, uh, a non-biased uh, judge. So, so not, yourself. <laughs> not yourself. Not <laughs> yourself. 
and yeah, not yourself. So I'll, I'll let I'll let people uh, chime in on that on our on our Facebook page. But anyway, anyway, if you if you think I look bad after nine hours, you should have seen me at five hours a few days ago. Oh, check this, out the YouTube videos. We've seen Keone in various forms. <laughs> yeah, and most of those are <laughs> sleep deprived. Most of those are sleep deprived. But anyway. Um, yeah, you can always tell, right? Yeah. You can always tell when I'm wearing my hat and, uh, and I'm pulling it down. Yeah, not looking so good. But anyway, the, the study was done. Um, it's actually a study where they took people. Oh, you had a good night's sleep? Take a snapshot. Okay, you had a poor night's sleep? Take a snapshot. And then they have a non-biased group uh, rank them. And what they found, invariably, people are ranked more attractive with the more sleep they had and less attractive with the less sleep they had. Yeah. And I mean, with everything you just said, it makes sense because you're evolutionary knowing that the person is going to have better reproductive abilities, you know, better hormone levels to do everything. Whether yeah. you inherently know that or not, you're, you know it. You're right. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left and we're on a roll. So let's just talk about um, sleep loss in the immune system. Mm. Okay. Cause that's huge. Yeah, super important right now. All right, so the general rule is sleep recharges your immune system. All right, so if you get anything else from this part, it recharges your immune system. Dr. Eric Prather out of the University of California, San Francisco, he took 150 men and women, measured their sleep for a week to get baselines. And then what he did is he squirted the common cold virus in their nose. They were kept in a lab after, for a week afterwards and monitored. Their blood and saliva are measured for antibodies. They, what he found was the less sleep they had, the more likely they would catch a cold. Um, so this says a lot about the current viral pandemic that we're going through. Um, I'm sure the more sleep you get, at least based on the studies on viral infections, the less likely you're going to get a viral illness. The more likely your body will be able to create antibodies, mount a good immune response to it. This is especially important in cold and flu season. I tell my patients that during cold and flu season, sure, I can give you some immune enhancing, you know, nutraceuticals, but the most important thing you can do to prevent from getting the flu um, and, a, and from a natural perspective is getting a lot of sleep during these things. And especially right now at the viral pandemic, most of us are stuck at home. Most of us are doing work online or virtually. Focus on your sleep especially if you have to go out in the crowds and things like that, or like me and you how I have to see patients, you know, right. it's like, it's like even more important for healthcare providers. Yeah. Um, th then the other thing that another study was done on flu vaccinations on um, the more sleep people got, the better the antibody response. So those people getting seven to nine hours of sleep in the week before a uh, week before they got the vaccination had a powerful, healthy immune response and antibody reaction. Um, and the same had been uh, reported for uh, hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccines. Um, the opposite is true for people who did not get a knife, enough sleep. Um, so the individual who doesn't get enough sleep, basically they never mounted a full immune reaction to the flu vaccine. This may speak to why some people are more prone to getting the flu, mm -hmm. even after getting the flu vaccine or vaccinations, it may speak to not getting enough sleep. Um, so it's very important. Like if you really want your vaccination to work based on what I'm reading or seeing with the sleep is you want to get plenty of sleep. So your vaccination works better and can mount a proper response to it. Yeah. Yeah. Super um, important today. Yeah. There's a specific cell in your body called a natural killer cell. This cell is stereotypically known as the cell that goes travels throughout your body and targets cancer. Um, Dr. Michael Irwin out of the University of California, Los Angeles, demonstrated that a single night of four hours of sleep swept away 70% of your natural killer cells circulating your immune system. Basically, they weren't present. Okay, so this study again was done in healthy young men. All right, so that says a lot. So it wasn't done in immunocompromised people. So you don't get some sleep for you know, a single night, your NK killer cells are like on vacation, which means that cancer may, you know, plant itself and grow if they're on vacation, you yeah. know. Um, epidemiological studies um, have also shown that night workers have higher rates of cancer, people have erratic uh, work who, who don't, don't have good sleep also have higher rates of cancer. Um, 
basically, and actually in Denmark right now, um, based on some of these studies, they're starting to compensate night shift workers who develop breast cancer. Um, wow. which is fascinating because they're kind of yeah. like saying, okay, the studies are so much that we need to do something about this. A large European study of almost 25,000 individuals demonstrated that sleep less than six hours is associated with a 40% increased risk of developing cancer relative to those sleeping seven hours or more. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. So talk about sleep as being a preventive. I think we could even make the jump to saying natural treatment also for cancer. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, also think about what we were talking about—the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, and everything it did to cortisol and creating inflammation and so on and so on. Well, the more inflammation you have, the higher your your cancer risk. So, inflammation increases cancer risk, as we know. We know that sleep promotes inflammation. But it wasn't just about with some of these studies. It wasn't just about increasing, uh, you know, cancer risk. In animal studies, what they found is lack of sleep. Um, also causes any cancers that are there or that are developing to be more aggressive. So you get lack of sleep, you're more likely to get cancer and that cancer is gonna be uh, less able to be treated probably due to the standard treatment, they're much more aggressive. So they grow faster, they take over the body faster, they kill you faster. So lack of sleep, those are in animal studies. And part of the reason that may be going on is because cancer usually starts at the biomolecular level at the genes. So let's just talk about lack of sleep and the DNA and genetics. What we know are thousands of genes in the, in the body and the brain depend on consistent sleep for proper regulation and expression. So if you deprive a mouse in the study of sleep just one night, um, gene activity level drops by 200%. That's crazy. And then, um, uh, a researcher, uh, Dr. Dirk Jan uh, Dyke at a Surrey Sleep Center research in England um, restricted healthy young men and women to six hours of sleep per night after one week of activity, um, of genetic activity. They saw of, of, uh, se of 711 genes, right? Basically, he was looking at the activity of 711 genes. He found that the activity level of them were compromised relative to the genetic activity profile, these same individuals, when they attained 8.5 hours of sleep for the week. So the genes were not expressing themselves in a healthy way. Half the genes revved up their expression, and what that means is, and the genes that revved up their expression, they revved up their expression associated with increased inflammation and cellular stress and cardiovascular disease. The other half turned down their positive effects of repair right? Which is stable metabolism, optimal immune system, uh, repair of the body. So half create a, uh, create a problem and the other half turn down to create more of a problem. So you get a double whammy. Yeah. I mean, a million time whammy. It seems like you're yeah, becoming right. less you with your prefrontal cortex, your genes right. are expressing themselves. I'm like, good gosh. Right. And then we also have uh, at the genetic level, we see that it shortens your telomeres. Telomere shortening is one of the mechanisms uh, of that, aging. Yeah, yeah, that brings on aging. You, you have increased shortened telomeres. You are biochemically a lot older, older than your years show. So less sleep uh, disrupts, disrupts that. And also less sleep, you know, every, with every waking day, we get little nicks in our genetic code. And what they're finding is that, and there's little uh, proteins that, that basically run along your DNA that help repair the DNA when it sees little nicks and things and it'll help repair. Well, guess what? You don't sleep well, those, you don't, those nicks don't get repaired. So of course you're more prone when those don't get repaired, you're more prone to cancer, right? So you're reading a, a compromised genetic code, which can lead to cancer in many, many cases. So you're talking about mutations that don't get repaired. Um, and it's not just lack of sleep, it's also inappropriate timing of sleep. So you may say, oh, well, you know, it's no big deal. You know, I slept 8.5 hours, um, you know, last night at appropriate time, went to bed at 10, got up at like 6.30. Um, and then for the next few nights, I didn't, I slept during the day, but I, total time I got 8.5 and you just have this really erratic sleep schedule. Well, that seems to be a problem at the genetic level too, so. Anyway, so there's, there's good evidence that supports the old adage of, you know, get your beauty sleep or, or sleep is a fountain of use, youth. I mean, it is absolutely, it's absolutely true based on what the science is showing.
Yeah, absolutely. This is like a scared straight episode for getting your sleep. <laughs> get your get your sleep. <laughs> now, now nobody's going to be able to sleep because they're going to be like, holy shit, Keone and Brian, they're like. They're going to be so anxious. <laughs> I know, I'm so anxious based on this pop podcast that I can't sleep and I can't. And that's going to be a vicious cycle. I hope well, I didn't do that. I, I, what, what Brian and I. <laughs> we'll calm you down next episode with a way to yeah, get we'll to try sleep. To, yeah, actually, just stick with us because we're going to give you a bullet, bullet points on how to get appropriate sleep. Don't stress about this. Just get in bed. Try to get as much sleep as you can. We're going to try to wrap it all, <laughs> all up in the next couple of weeks um, to improve your sleep. If you've been following us, you know a lot of the things we're going to say about improving your sleep because we've talked about a lot on a number of podcasts. But we'll go through the bullet list and we'll have a PDF so you guys don't, don't stress. Yeah, absolutely. And if you really need something to help you go to sleep, put on an old episode of the podcast, you know, one of those <laughs> real bad ones from the beginning when we're barely coming yeah. through. We don't know what we're yeah, doing. Yeah, uh, good. yeah. Actually, actually, you know, it's funny. I, actually, I think I actually had somebody say, <laughs> uh oh, I actually had somebody. Is this going to hurt us? Yeah, well, it, it may help based on this podcast. Basically, you know, yeah, you, <laughs> sometimes your droning will put me to sleep. Well, good. All I can say, if my droning can help you to sleep, then listen to our podcast. Yeah, but right? leave us a review. I, yeah, your yeah, health give us a review. <laughs> say, that, say that it helped. It's so boring and so terrible <laughs> that it can put you to sleep. But that's a good thing for us because we know that we're doing your body good. Five out of five stars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. All uh, right, everybody, thank you for listening. Thank you for sticking with us for an hour again. I wish we could shorten it. I just get really passionate. I know Brian does too, so... We'll try to shorten them as we go. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for sticking with us. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk with you next week. But before we go, I do want to mention our salad. So, Keone, you keep mentioning our PDF for sleep. Right now, we have the salad one. It is in it's the Well Man's Podcast salad or Keone's 14 word name for the salad. Yeah, I forget. It's like double <laughs> backflip. There we go. Summer There's salt. a somersault. Rainbow. Yeah, there's a summer salad in there. Rainbow. Get them big. Basically, you got to get salad. your sleep and recite this 10 times a day to be able to recite the, <laughs> yeah. the, the name of it. But we have the PDF where it details all the ingredients, how to prepare it, how to make sure it stores and stays for a week or more. Um, and like I've mentioned a few times on the podcast this year, I have been eating that salad quite a bit this year. And I just love it. It stays really well. It's super healthy. Um, and you can get that for free by clicking the show notes and the first link in the show notes is that PDF. And all we do is ask you a few questions like how we can make the show better, how you listen to the show, and you'll get that PDF right away. It'll be emailed to you and a new window will open and the PDF will pop up right there. Cool. All awesome, right. everybody. Thank you for listening. We'll talk with you next week. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye.